Hello, everyone. We're waiting on Raid to join our live Q and A. Welcome. Connecting. Hi. Hello. There you Hi, are. Finally connecting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's. It, I've never done this uh, live Instagram before, so. Me neither. So this is the okay, first for both cool. of us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's cool. I'm happy it's working cool. right at right yeah, the first too. try. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, well, welcome. Thank you for joining and thanks for taking this time. Thank you. Um, to talk to us at Thank Oyun, you. well, from the home, because right now we can't open the center. So, um, which also led us to be able to, you know, start this film series and show a film from you who is not in Berlin, which is wonderful. Um, yes. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. So I'm in San Francisco. Uh, I've been uh, in California for the past three years. Um, and I'm because I'm doing a PhD. And actually, this week has been a, a really important week for me because I just moved from being a PhD student to being a PhD candidate. Oh wow! Which for people who don't do a, who are not doing a PhD doesn't mean anything, but for me it's just like a, a big big step forward. What does it mean? Uh, I mean, in like essence. Uh, in essence, is uh, I mean because I, I think in the U.S. the PhD PhD programs tend to be much. Uh, much more demanding than in Europe. So you have to, for the first three years, you're taking courses, you're, then you have to do a qualifying exam, which is a very long process. I'm not going to go through it. And then you write a prospectus, a plan for your dissertation, then you defend it. Then you're a candidate where you can finally work on your uh, dissertation. Okay. So yeah, so I'm past that, which is good. So Big steps, so congratulations Thank <laughs> for you. getting there. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, so we've been streaming your film, uh, Ekomi Ekoti, is that correctly pronounced? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I don't speak Italian, but luckily there's English subtitles. Um, yes. And it was a lot in French too, correct? Yes, yeah. because the French was the language that when I met Sandro... He uh, he lived in Beirut. He was teaching Italian there, and he spoke French very well. And as many know, like Lebanon was a French mandate, so French is um, is really a, like predominant language there. So that was our common language. Yeah. And yeah, then I, I slowly. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, just like the Italian is that I slowly over the years. Uh, He's, we were together for seven years, and over the years, I would just go to Italy, and 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 in the beginning, it was it was really frustrating because nobody speaks other than Italian, or most people um, won't do the effort. So I felt excluded a bit, and and then I thought, well, if I am to really enjoy myself there and connect with the family and friends, I I need the Italian. So you know. Yeah, so so you learned learned Italian. Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's a beautiful language. It's not very useful <laughs> once you like, if if you don't go to Italy. But it's it's so beautiful that and it was really worth it. I think. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, I I was watching this film, and I my first thought was it's it's such a personal topic uh well personal film you're one of the two subjects of the film you yourself um you allow a very deep insight into your personal life so mm -hmm. and it felt very raw um so mm -hmm. i was wondering i mean why did you even choose to make such a film yeah i mean this was uh this was a ha very hard process i mean it, it really took me years to come to terms to what what I'm doing exactly in this film and why I'm doing this film. Um, and when I met Sandra, I was working with my sister on our first feature film together, 74. And before that, I was a, I was a journalist. I wasn't really a filmmaker. I was I worked for documentaries as a researcher, 
but I, I really worked for print journalism, but I loved cinema. So as I was going out with Sandra, I was also discovering uh, filming. Um, I had bought a camera and, uh, and I was taking photos and he became kind of my muse. So the, actually a lot from the first part of the film is not, there, there was no intention to make a film. It was just, you know, having a camera and having someone who's willing to be your guinea pig. <laughs> And I, but I felt later on, as we kept on talking, that there was so much resonance because, between our very private personal conversations and what was happening uh, around us, the, the relationships between Lebanon and, or, or the Middle East in general and Europe. Um, those, I think those years where there were a lot of discussions in many countries about gay marriage. And I thought that it, those discussions were very one dimensional, especially in the media, and they didn't really capture you know the complexity of thinking about uh the marriage institution within like uh in relation to um, to a gay couple and how complex that is and and what that really involves and also thinking about this transnational connection between europe and and um, the South with all the borders and restrictions. And um, and then after a while, Sandro had moved back to Italy. And um, so it became a long distance relationship. And, and, and then the question of marriage what, took another dimension, the one of, you know, um, visas for, for me, like, how can I move to Europe? Do I want to move to Europe? Um, how is that possible? Um, so there were all these political dimensions and I, I was thinking the personal is political and, and then all these pieces came together. But the, the film looked different in the first cut. I had include, there, were, there was a, um, a gay um, Syrian refugee couple whom I had met and who became my friends and they were part of the conversation. There was someone else who was also part of the conversation. But it, it felt to me that the film became too, um, too much designed to give information. Mm. Um, and I, at the end, I decided after consulting with my sister, who's an amazing filmmaker herself and other people, I just felt that this film needs to remain in that very intimate uh, space for me to also have that political resonance. It doesn't need the extra layer of, of explaining, um, you know, what, what it means to be gay in, in Lebanon, because I think that's also something very complex and I, I didn't really want to explain to people uh, you know, because it was always going to be reductive to turn this into a, a representative film of, of, mm. of what it means to be gay. I, I, I really wanted to reflect more on the big existential questions of life in, in a couple, whether it's gay or not gay, and how those existential questions, um, how they resonate in the world today with all the geopolitics um, around us and that affects us and affects our intimate lives. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's so interesting because, um, because I, I, I was, I, we were briefly emailing and um, I was also wondering this idea of being, you know, being pressured to fall into a specific box in order to be able to promote your film more across probably if we talk about mostly the Western, you know, global North world that is trying to always find certain topics that they want to hang on to. Um, as I had briefly told you, our Uyun is, you know, our mission is to provide a platform for migrant decolonial and queer feminist art and culture. And so we, I'm, I feel like your film, and that's one of the reasons why we picked your film as one of the first ones, the first mm -hmm. one for our series, is because Thank it touches you. on so many levels, but with this, with this personal perspective that you're just talking about, it, it tries to, you know, it, it shows your look onto it. 
And um, it, uh, in my opinion, I felt like it was cutting through these these very stereotypicalized forms mm -hmm. of expressing these um, topics and issues. Um, what has there been, what, what, what kind of pressure have you felt uh, around uh, fitting into a certain box? Yeah, th th first, thank you for choosing the film. I feel like really honored and I, uh, I didn't know Yoon before uh, Irit, um, the film co-producer, told me about it and the distributor. Uh, so I, I looked at the website and I was really pleased to be featured within that platform. Because, yeah, I mean, the journey of making, I mean, there's the journey of making the film itself um, uh, as a filmmaker, but there's also the journey of, um, of trying to have funds. And this is always like an interesting process for every project. Uh, but especially, specifically for this project, uh, I felt that I was very quickly boxed into, you know, the box of someone who's making a gay film uh, and someone from the Middle East, so Muslim making a gay film. Um, and I really wanted to escape those boxes. I mean, even though the film reflects on on that, but it, it is also a post-identitarian film. It's, it's just really trying to think about something beyond, um, you know, the limits of, of how gay identity in the Middle East is framed. Um, and so I, I remember, just to be very concrete and specific, um, before the film was finished, I applied for a workshop uh, within um, um, uh, a film festival, documentary film festival in Europe, and and uh, the way it works is that you show a cut of the film, and then there's a moderator who asks you asks you questions, and and then there are other like producers or people who might be interested in the film uh, watching. And the first question they asked me uh, something in the lines of, "What does it mean to be Muslim and gay?" and and I remember saying, like, first, why do you assume my identity as a Muslim? I mean, I grew up as Muslim, and this is my cultural the cultural background, but would you ask someone who's Christian, what does it mean to feel, like who's coming from Europe, what does it mean to be Christian and gay? And it's just like, it was just assuming a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think I was really revolted to this always uh, pairing of homophobia with Islam, like right away. Um, and, and I, I said, like, this is not my intention. I'm not trying to make, uh, to explain, like, Islam or the Muslim world. It, it's just so vast. Like, I never hear of someone explaining the Christian world, you know, <laughs> to, <laughs> to an audience. It, it, it's just, what you're asked is just so vast, and you're just asked to reduce it um, into something so stereotypical. And I feel it was like that. I mean, Irit can, can also attest to that because there were people whom she approached in festivals in Europe who would say, oh, it's not Lebanese enough or it's not Arab enough. And then I'm like, what does it mean <laughs> to, have, like, to make an Arab film or a Lebanese mm -hmm. film? So I, I think there were those expectations of how, uh, I mean, certain people in Europe want to see the Middle East and want to see a gay person like as a victim in the Middle East. Um, and so this was like really annoying to me. Uh, but also I felt that they don't want a filmmaker from Lebanon to say something about Europe. And I was trying to also say something about Europe that through this relationship with Sandra, I just understood something about, um, and again, I'm not trying to reduce Europe to, to that one image, but there, there was something really resonant about uh, individualism, individual, individuality, the family, that that cost of you know coming out in in that environment, and it made me reflect on, you know, what does it mean to come out in a space where communities are so strong? Is that the only way? Um, is there another way? I mean, just questions, not really with ready-made answers but that I felt really resonated in, in that relationship between, between the, the southern part of the, 
of the Mediterranean and the northern part. Um, and yeah, I just felt that the boxing of a gay film from the Middle East does not allow people to really think of the other dimensions that uh, the film could have, which is again questioning those um, um, relationships uh, across the Mediterranean, trans-Mediterranean relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we just had a, a question in the comments. I thought maybe we get to that briefly before we continue with some of the ones I've prepared. Um, Dorothy is asking, um, she says, B. Ruby Rich talks about subtitling and the importance of language in film. Most of your film work includes language, spoken and written subtitles. Have you considered other sonic experiences? Basically, she says, exploring other sonic textures related to queerness and transnational relationships. Mm. Oh, that's a really interesting question. And I have to say also, I'm so lucky. I'm doing my PhD at UC Santa Cruz and, uh, and uh, B. Ruby Rich is actually one of the professors. So I've had so many opportunities to meet her and talk to her, which is amazing. Um, uh, and yes, no, definitely language was a big part of it. Um, I would say in, in, a, in a very banal way first, because, you know, we don't share mother tongue, so we had to uh, invent way. And, and French is not a mother tongue for neither of us. So that's why um, this allowed for space for also other languages. Like as I learned more Italian, I mean, we mainly remain not like, speaking French together, but this is maybe just trivial, but Sandro wanted to strengthen his English, so we could speak English sometimes. So naturally this kind of uh, language dialogue thing, and he learned Arabic actually, but his Arabic mm. was never good enough. <laughs> it takes <laughs> Europeans much longer to learn Arabic. It's a hard language uh, to uh, learn, yeah. <laughs> but, but it does, so I don't know if I'm asking you a question, but the first layer is that, of course, the fact that we're using French tells a lot about these post-colonial, uh, you know, uh, power dynamics or rapports that we were using uh, French uh, as a com communication language and not Arabic, even though Luciano, uh, sorry, Sandro is, <laughs> Luciano is my new partner, so <laughs> Sandro is living in, in uh in beirut um and I, I i i am thinking like sometimes there is an idea of, so i don't know if that answers the question but i, w I was thinking about uh pre-colonial languages of commerce that were used in the in the mediterranean when people for example uh came from venice to like i don't know tripoli my hometown to do commerce and they had these forms of, I forgot now what, what they're called, but these sort of languages that borrowed from other different languages as ways to communicate. Uh, and of course this was replaced later on by French when during colonial times and by English like nowadays. Uh, but yeah, I haven't really thought about that. I mean, the sonic, the, the sounds in the film was very, were very very important i did record a lot of sounds i took a lot of photos but it was also something that i was very uh, attentive to just capture sounds and i, I worked with an amazing sound designer uh lama um uh, and and with lama i re like we really worked on so I did the first edit of sounds, but I really wanted to keep those raw sounds as, you know, el an element to drive the story as well. Um, so yeah, definitely I thought about sound. Yeah, yeah, because something that also struck me, of course, right at the beginning is these like um, series of still images that you put there and you layer it with these sounds and to me, the sounds brought the images alive. Like at mm. times I couldn't, I wasn't quite sure if the image is actually moving or not. And then there was some that started moving and then I realized it's not a still image. So I was wondering um, how were these images created and where did this idea come from to, to you know, put images uh, with the sounds? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I was, I remember also in one of the workshops where an editor was told me, 
Oh, I, I really don't like films where we see what's happening. It's like, you know, I don't know if you've been to Paris, to Beaubourg, you know, having the pipes outside. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, I was kind of revealing some of that through the structure of the film. Um, like thinking of how, how do we create continuity within a film that glosses over the the choppiness and the fragmentation of it, right? Because I'm, I'm, I am telling the story of, of something, you know, of life, but reducing it, compressing it. Um, and quite naturally, I really wanted to reflect on that process of fragmentation that I think is very, speaks a lot to our time, to how we capture like fragments of reality constantly, how we, how we relate to them, we consult them. And it became a, like that choppiness and that fragmentation became a metaphor of the, of the modern kind of relationship where, especially that long distance relationship that becomes all the time about trying to construct a seamless continuity when everything is fragmented. And then for me, like in my head, at least it just took another layer of also that fragmented relationship between, you know, Southern Mediterranean and Northern Mediterranean. Um, and I, I really felt strong about that. I mean, also the, just, I felt that there was a lot of poetry in just mixing all of this together, like sound and image and sometimes there's uh, harmony, sometimes it's it's dissonant, you don't quite put the things together. Um, yeah. Yeah, for me, it actually created quite a bit of sense of discomfort as I was watching it. Um, and it, it felt like I was I was living through this experience of this relationship that is, you know, fragmented, as you were saying, or sort of choppy, and you can't build this continuum. But but you were building the continuum as I was feel it, it was a it was a very like it was an experience as a film, which I um, thought was yeah I really enjoyed um, going about um, yeah um, we had another question online that was uh, asked on our website mm -hmm. so maybe I will go with mm -hmm. that um, someone anonymously asked. Uh, why did you choose to bring Pasolini in your questions? Interestingly, I watched Sa Salo in its entirety for the first time in Beirut and hence could never unlink the two. Pasolini rarely mm -hmm. pointed to his homosexuality, I think. So it would be mm -hmm. interesting to hear about your associations with regards to your film. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I like there's so many also layers to that choice. I mean, the first one was because Sandro is Italian and we were both like really cinephiles. And I think that's the first thing that really joined us together. I think the first day we met, we met on this tour of uh, through a common friend. We were in this public tour of um, old neighborhood in Beirut, Zucat Le Blot. And, and I show images of that neighborhood with a lot of uh, buildings that were destroyed during the civil war, so a lot of ruins. So I really wanted to go back to that place. But but then that same day, later in the evening, we went to see uh, a film in the cinema, and I I think it was it was a Fellini documentary or something, a documentary about Fellini. I don't remember exactly, but but film was something that joined us, and then um, I I knew that. Pasolini had visited Beirut in 1974, and he was, you know, assassinated brutally in 75. Uh, and he and Beirut, the civil war in Beirut started in 75. So there was a lot of things that I don't tell in the film, but there was a lot of emotional thing. And then also the fact that the the woman, the older woman that we see in the film, is actually Sandro's great aunt that we used to visit every summer. Um, and she was the person in his family who was the most accepting of him, but without saying it. Like she would give us the the bedroom that used to belong to her husband, but never really, you know, refer to us as a couple. It was just <laughs> for her, we at least in the conversation, we were friends and I loved that. 
But she lived very close to Casarsa, which is the town where Pasolini was born and to where Pasolini was buried. So Sandro took me to to that place and, and it was just amazing to see the you know the cemetery where where, where Pasolini was uh uh buried and he also had like this relationship with the east i mean the way he fantasized orientalized the 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 middle east so there were a lot of uh you know connections um and the fact that i had filmed also i had filmed the cemetery and sandra and the cemetery before also knowing that i was going to do a film it was just it was one one of those summers i was there um uh, and then we later on we went also to the place where he was assassinated uh, and for me, yes, like Pasolini doesn't really explicitly talk about homosexuality in his films, uh, but he's someone whose homosexuality was became a known fact uh, when he was young. I think in his 20s, he was discovered with other boys and then he had to leave his town, go to... Uh, he was kicked out from the Communist Party um, in Northern Italy. He, has, he had to move to Rome with his mother. Uh, they lived very poorly in the uh, Borgate. So, uh, and actually I saw a documentary that shows how also Pasolini was always in the news as the faggot, you know. Mm. So he, he, he was a known figure uh, as a queer person, as a gay person, and he was assassinated by uh, someone who, you know, he was in the vicinity of Rome cruising and there's a lot of mystery about his assassination i don't want to talk about this but but there was a lot of the the tragic there was a lot of the he was this tragic figure who was a leftist intellectual but also queer uh and and i like that conversion that we see between queer life and leftist life because i feel that's so essential for me like my fight is not about is not a queer fight. It's a it's a fight for another different alternative world that is more just and and I cannot separate the two. And for me, Pasolini really joins the two. But it's also that um, really tragic destiny, you know, that tragic uh, killing that is kind of the looming tragedy for queer people. Um, and I, I, I wanted to address that. Sorry, this is a very long answer. And then the last thing I would say, also there's in, in his film, so I think cinephiles will get that, but, but you know, for a lot of people, maybe it will not be as apparent, but there's Medea was filmed. Uh, the interior I think was uh, in Pisa, but the external shots of the palace where Medea was shot is actually in Aleppo. Oh. So I also liked that, the two spaces. <laughs> and and then the the scene I, I show from the day are cuts from the inside to the outside, which is Aleppo. And then you hear sh shotguns and, and voices that I had found, was found sounds from fights in Aleppo. So it was also a reference to the war in Syria. But I mean, there are a lot of subtle things that will not be apparent to everybody, but just... Mm. Also, another layer with why Pasolini figures and, and all those different parts of the film. Wow, interesting. Yeah, so much, in, so much depth in that. To now that we can only that we talk to you, we find out, or at least for me, a lot of the references I hadn't seen. So I mean, I'll have to go watch it again. <laughs> um, do you? Can you tell a little bit more about the process of making the film? Um, you were talking about, you know, that you started out by just filming parts of your relationship with Sanjo without thinking about making the film at the beginning. But uh, um, once you decided to turn it into a film, what was the process like for you? Yeah, so I mean, and so the, in the seven years that we were together, there was one, um, one year when I was in New York, I was doing a master's and video journalism filmmaking and sandro came and stayed a little bit with me in new york uh, and i was i really i don't know why there was 
the desire to make after 74 I really had the desire to make a personal film about queerness but I didn't know how and and within a class I did this short documentary with Sandra while he was there but it was like very informative you know it had a voice over we're talking it's it's like it really hits all the marks and then when I finished it I felt <laughs> oh this is totally not what I want to do so at least I saw <laughs> What I didn't want to do, you know, classic, you know, documentary. Oh, I'm gay. I'm from the Middle East. He's European. <laughs> let's get married and live somewhere else. Um, and and then I went back to Lebanon and I had the chance of of doing a residency with Ashkal Alwan, which is an amazing art uh, organization. So I did find the supports um, to really make it. And I would just. Um, so I had this residency for two months that allowed me time and space to edit. But I think as many independent filmmakers, I really had to, you know, make this film over long periods of time, which, which I think was good as well, because I really had to leave it, come back to it. Um, and then I would edit, you know, in the evenings, I had all kinds of like freelance jobs. So I I wasn't like dedicated to the film, but I would come back to it and I would just maybe see Sandro. Sometimes I would film, other times not, because, you know, it's it's also very awkward. Uh, and at some point I felt, okay, <laughs> I cannot film anymore. And this is also, uh, you know, affecting our dynamic. Uh, and then it took ve a very long time to just sit with the material and, and so many cuts and and then i worked with an editor who's amazing um uh, and but then she had to leave uh and i i was left alone with the film which was also very hard to see yourself edit yourself but and i met irit who's uh my amazing a co-producer uh, and uh, distributor of the film who was in Berlin. We had a lot of conversations. So yeah, I would say a lot of like years of, of conversations with people, of going back and forth to editing and filming. Um, and it was both like a really interesting and exciting process, but it was also very difficult. And I feel that that difficulty really manifests itself in the Tripoli scene because in, in the Tripoli scenes, I really was very, I couldn't utter words. I was so silent and, and the idea of coming out was just so difficult that I, I just thought that the f best way to confront the city I was from was to have this meditative sort of visual relationship with it. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Uh, wow, that's a, uh, that just a uh, hit. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what, what do you, so what was the greatest challenge for you that you faced during making the film? I think the greatest challenge is to, to like be be myself. I mean, and and be in like vulnerable on camera. But in a way, it was also a very important process as a journalist and filmmaker because I interview a lot of people. Like I ask that of people to be vulnerable and intimate, whether in articles or in in front of the camera. So I felt that somehow I like I owe it to also be vulnerable. I mean, it wasn't really something I, you know, thought about in explicitly, but but I think that as I was doing this, and I, I, it, I was just reminding myself that, you know, I do this with other people. Why not with myself? And that was the challenge, I think, and also like the coming to terms with making this film and, and making it public uh, in a country like Lebanon. I mean, the film was never, we, we have to still, um, even though Beirut is like a great um, hub that has a lot of amazing people and 
and it has many like queer like friendly pockets and all of this but it, it, it is still very challenging to be gay in Lebanon because mm. uh, you know of a, a law against homosexuality because also of the of the institutions and structures so as a filmmaker you have to submit your film to the uh, Sûreté Générale which uh, to uh, officers basically and they have to approve your film so I never did that. I never wanted to do that. And then the film, when it was screened at a film festival in Beirut, it was actually screened at, um, at the French embassy because they're the only space that is allowed to screen films without going through the mm -hmm. Cité Générale. So yeah, that's also ironic. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's an ongoing fight, I think, mm. to... Uh, and there were other queer filmmakers who had made films who also didn't want to submit them to the Sûreté Générale. And, and so then the festival made it a thing to screen those films within that alternative space. Um, yeah. Have you felt any repercussions after screen, making this film public, either personal no. or public? No, because it's, it's at, at the end, it's like an independent niche film, so it wasn't really... Like, I didn't go and screen it in Tripoli or, you know, I mean, if, if in the, me like, in the media they catch attention to that, that could create uh, some repercussions. Mm -hmm. But not if you just don't provoke that, and I didn't really provoke that. I mean, it was screened at that space in Beirut, and then, um, and then maybe I should have, that's part of the, the struggle, and, uh but I don't know, I didn't feel like, after making the film, I didn't feel like having another fight of, of being publicly visible. And um, I felt there were other people doing this. And um, and I felt that this film, I wanted it also to circulate as, uh, not only as, as a gay coming out film, but as a film about life and, and love and, um, and the world. Uh, and how it like the world how it, the world infiltrates into uh, intimacy basically mm. um, something that is also important for us at Uyun is to you know support um, up and coming artists or people that want to create art um, so I was wondering um, what would one advice from you be for a filmmaker who's just about to get started? Um, is there anything you would mm. tell your younger self? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, I think uh, you hear a lot of things, a lot of people, I mean, the way the, the film world works today, especially in documentary, is that you have a lot of people around you who are trying to guide you in certain directions. And some of that is great. I mean, it's, that's a great support creatively, financially, in all levels. But you really have to know how to discern what you want from what other people are telling you. So I would say, don't compromise. And mm -hmm. even though sometimes you do pay a price in terms of you know distribution or circulation or but I, I really feel I, I really stick to that and um, is like not to compromise with the vision I have, not to compromise with what I want to tell the world, even if it's not going to be the commercial su success that um, maybe uh, you would have by, you know, doing films differently or um, having like a, you know, bigger producer, bigger distributor, making the film more commercial. But I really feel that, uh, you know, not compromising on, on your personal vision is, is, is really my advice, if that's an advice. Thanks. Um, I, I, I would want to ask about any up and coming projects you're working on, but you're say, you were saying that you're working on your PhD. Maybe you want to explain a bit more about what that is on the topic or yeah, any other I mean, projects? It, it, is a, it's a, it is a project based PhD. So it's one of those, uh, I think there are not a lot of programs. That's why I chose uh, UC Santa Cruz because they have this really great program that is project based. So you do write a dissertation 
dissertation, excuse me, but you're working on also a film project. Uh, and so in the past years, I mean, I think after this film, I really felt that I wanted to make a film in Tripoli, about Tripoli, because it, it's, an, it's a city that never ceases to amaze me, even though just going back there brings a lot of antagonistic m memories. I mean, this is where I grew up. I, l I left it when I was 18. My parents still live there, so I go back and forth. And in the past three years, I've been in California, but I go... I spent three months of summer in Tripoli and sometimes also in the winter break. So I've been filming a lot there. I, um, I still, it, it is going to be an essayistic creative documentary, very different from Ecomi, but it, it's still like the form is, is changing in my head, especially that so much has happened in Lebanon since October. And I've been present to some of it, but not all of it. So yeah, I really want to think, I think after Ecomi, for me, like what became very essential is that the project, the queer project cannot be a human rights project alone, cannot be a project of gay rights. It has to be a more inclusive project where queerness is about reimagining the world. It, it's about, you know, dismantling patriarchy and all of what that entails. Um, and I felt that Tripoli as a city tells the story uh, uh, of, it, like, that I want to imagine what, what it means for the city itself to be queer. And queer in the sense, of, not only in the sense of sexuality, but in the sense of, you know, thinking the world in a non-reproductive way or in a different way. Uh, and, and so this is what I'm working on, but I'm also making some video essays with found footage that I'm also excited about. It's a, a new form uh, of film that I haven't tried before. So I, I'm making a film around the, the bathhouse of the Hammam to tell like the link between histories of, of, uh, of sexuality and histories of empire um, so it is also going to be like an eclectic film, but still thinking about it. But th those are the projects I'm working on. And that's part of the PhD project okay. overall. Cool. Wow. Um, I'm going to check briefly if there is any other questions. There's a comment that um, Rafat said, most relationships are fragmented and choppy, even those that, not, that are not separated by physical distance. So that's uh, yeah, something that's to think friend. about. <laughs> <laughs> that's my, my very dear friend. It is true, yeah. I mean, it's not like this is, as I said in the beginning, I said that this is uh, really related to modernity. And, and um, you know, Walter Benjamin talks about this, right, about like experiencing modernity in the beginning of the 20th century in Weimar, Berlin. And he talks a lot about the, you know the fragmentation that uh, that modernity creates, um, and imagine like ninety years later. <laughs> I mean, if we can from the nineteen twenties, thinking about now, uh, you know that fragmentation has been exacerbated uh, because of like you know the screens as well, and then how you have the collapse of geography of like fragments from anywhere in the world coming into your bedroom or your living room. So yeah, I mean, definitely fragmentation is not, is something that we're experiencing in general. Um, but it just happened that that was exacerbated by the fact that we were not living on a day-to-day -day basis together for a long time, that we were just meeting during those times and, and and in those moments, you really want to capture the most out of it. So you're filming more, you're recording more, and then you're coming back uh, to to your home and in that case to Beirut, and then you're thinking about those memories and your fragments. And as a filmmaker, you're putting them together. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Going briefly off of that, if I may ask, um, has it... Did it uh, affect your relationship that you created this film? 
to tell I mean, I mean, no, I mean, it's still, uh, I'm still friends with Sandro and I actually told him about this. He promoted it to his <laughs> entourage and showed it to his friends and he saw it again. And then he told me, we had this conversation actually last week. He said, like, it's, the song is so much shorter than in my memory. <laughs> so he did watch a lot of the cuts and he was always on board. Um, and yeah, I would n have never made this film if he didn't agree. But but I think the, the interesting dynamic was that he never wanted to be, even though he had actually took some photos when he, he was younger, but he never really wanted to be the one recording and or taking photos on any of the trips or any of the moments. And this is when uh, there was one moment where I, I asked him about this one place we went to in Yosemite Park. Uh, and I told him to, like, what do you remember of this place? And he went on for, like, actually more than seven minutes, like eight minutes, and remembering with great details. Uh, and then later on, I felt, oh, this is how I need to end the film, in black with that memory that was so crisp and clear without any photos, without any imagery. And then I felt, oh, I spent this entire years just recording, filming, capturing. And, and, and somehow it's not important because the, what was great is that for him, he kept all of that in his mind mm. with its hesitations and its, you know, black holes like in the middle. But it was such a beautiful revelation to me uh, of, I mean, it became like a metaphor of, of what do we, with all these technologies that we have, what is the most precious thing that we keep is just the memory without any of those uh, external technological aids and uh, like things to help us record it and that raw memory. Uh, and and so yeah, it, then when I thought about it later, um, I mean, I had cut that last scene in many different ways, and then at the end I thought, okay, no, it's it's just gonna be just complete black, uh, because that's how it is. It's just a memory, and it was a bit radical. I think I was kind of scared, like to end the film, and and I think for people it's a bit jarring. You never know. Where is this leading until the last minute where he's like, oh, you didn't take photos? Of <laughs> there were no photos. That's the point of that moment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think that's a, that's a great place to maybe also end our memory together. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank is you there, so much. Well. Thank you so much, really, for taking this time on your early morning in California. Um, and thank you for sharing your film with us. Um, I also have hopefully recorded this uh, interview correctly. So we will um, keep this up on our Instagram page so others can continue oh, um, great. Yeah, thank seeing you. this. If you can, yeah, if you can send me, a, like, I don't know how this is transferable. <laughs> I will find a way. I will find a way for okay, sure. Great. Yes. Thank you so thank much. You. And enjoy your Sunday and hopefully next time we can welcome you at our actual space once we get to oh, open yes. it. Oh <laughs> yes, I would love that. I, it's been long since I visited Berlin so I kind of miss it. Like, yeah. Amazing city. Great. All right. Have a Great. Nice evening. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.